Mizmor Lasaf. And yet God is good to Israel, to the clean in heart. But as for me, my feet almost slipped, my step nearly slid, for I envied the arrogant. I saw the peace of the wicked. Their deaths are free of pain, their bellies are fat, they have no part in human trouble, they are not touched by human things, so that Arrogance is their badge of office. They wear violence like clothes. They narrow their eyes with evil. Dark fantasy flows from their hearts. They mock. They speak malice. They speak oppression as from on high. They have enthroned their mouths in the heavens. Their tongue walks around the earth, so people turn to them and lap up the waters of abundance, and they say, in what way does God know? In the Most High, is there knowledge? So, look, these are the wicked. Always at ease they increase their wealth, so it was for nothing I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. I have been struck down all the day, and my punishment is with me every morning. But if I had said, I will speak like this, look, I would have betrayed the generation of your sons. So I kept on thinking how I might understand this, and it was a trouble to my eyes until I came to the sacred places of God and understood their destiny and yet you put them in slippery places you throw them in deceptive ground in a moment they become a desolation entirely destroyed with terrors as one waking from a dream O oh lord you arise and throw off their image for my heart was embittered, and I was cut to the quick. I was like a brute. I knew nothing. I was a behemoth before you, yet I am with you always. You have grasped my right hand. You will guide me with your wisdom, and in the end you take me up in glory. Who but you do I have in heaven? Having you, there is nothing I desire on earth. My flesh and heart come to an end, but God is my rock of my heart and my portion for ever. For look, all who walk away from you perish. You destroy all who break faith with you. But as for me, the closeness of God is my good. In the Lord God I have made my shelter to recount all your works. So, Sue, this um, Psalm 73 comes at the beginning of, uh, of Book 3, um, and um, which is a quite a distinctive part of the uh, of the of the Psalter, isn't it? I wonder if you could just yeah. just tell us a bit about that. Well, I think it's interesting where it comes in the Psalter overall because it's almost midpoint, and it's it's sort of it's really um, questioning the rewards for obedient faith that we found in Psalm one, you know, it's the very beginning, and then it comes to a position. The psalmist comes to a position of actually affirming God and praising God, such as we find in Psalm one hundred and fifty. So it's got the two moods, you know, laying off mm. off each of the beginning and the ending. And, I think it's quite interesting to see how it's it is almost midpoint and yet very much as you say questioning uh, the justice of god and it belongs to the group of psalms particularly 73 to 77 there's lots and lots of connections linguistically between them all the theme of violence hamas in 73 6 and 74 20 you know that the, the, these are real issues that they're dealing with and the, the importance yes. of the sanctuary which comes in the psalms the sense of being under god's anger all the time and the pleas for God to judge fairly. These come repeatedly. The phrases come not just in Psalm 73, but in 74, right to 77. The mood changes a little bit in 78, but those, these, um, the whole of Book 3 
undoubtedly follows the same theme. Remember, O oh Lord, how long, O oh Lord, wilt thou judge, O oh Lord? You know, it's very oh. much the, lots and lots of angry questions about the failure of God to really justify who he is and to be just and questions of what we call theodicy. You know, a good, a, a good and powerful God doesn't seem to be either good or powerful. Yes, yes. And, and I mean, the, it's interesting that, I mean, I think you said earlier that uh, when we were talking that the, there aren't actually that that many interesting sort of um, takes on the the psalm mm -hmm. in, the, in the history. But one that you did you do talk about is actually the way George Herbert sort of um, yes. uses yes. that, which in yeah, in, yeah. in the in the collar. Exactly, and I think the the interesting thing is the way he rages at, at God, just like the psalmist in the beginning of seventy three. And um, you've certainly got the um, the sense that Herbert's um, within the sanctuary uh, at board, i.e. at the altar, and struggling for some answer to his problems about the presence and justice of God within mm. that psalm. In Psalm 73, the psalmist is outside the sanctuary and his problems are resolved once he goes into the sanctuary and has a sense of, sense of a vision. But then just like the psalmist in 73, um, Herbert, obviously, at the end of the collar, you have this resolution where, um, you know, he's 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 pacified and and um, uh, and and senses God's presence very much. Um, and uh, and the, the resolution, I think, in the collar and uh, yeah. in this poem, and actually, for that matter, in, in Job, is not so much a resolution by kind of, you know, lo lo logical or didactical mm. argument. It's a completely change of category. It's mm. it's a resolution which realizes God is God and I'm not God. Yes. yes. It's yes. about the transcendence and it's about trusting back to God the thing God knows better than you do, you know. Um, yes. Which so is what the psalmist is doing at the end of Psalm 73. That's just what the, and I think that comes out very beautifully, mm. um, that close, I mean, in some ways in, in, in yeah. um, Roger's, Roger's painting. But but yeah, where, where, when Herbert says me thought all the time I raved, or raged and grew yes. More, yes. more loud. Me hurt, grew more wild. Me thought I heard one calling child. child. Mm -hmm. And I replied, <laughs> My Lord. It's the my Lord at the end. It's sufficient yes. to say my yeah. Lord. My yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think this actually will lead us very nicely into actually Malcolm into to your your poem. Before we do that, may I just thank you for joining us um for these conversations if this happens to be the first one you've um you, you you've looked at um i better just tell you that they're uh, they're based on three books um malcolm's um david's crown 150 poems responding to the 150 psalms uh sue's <laughs> psalms through the centuries this is the third volume of her uh comprehensive uh reception history of the psalms so the also actually a commentary on the psalms at the same time uh, and then this was um the book of praises which is my uh selection of my illustrated translations of the psalms they these were based actually on on um uh three books that i did this is the book three um of the psalms i've only got to book three but um i have actually done the translation for book four so maybe um this year i'll get around to, to doing the illustrations of that you can incidentally see the um archive of all these conversations if you go to the link um below but but anyway going back malcolm to your poem um uh, responding to this and i've i noticed in, in quite a lot of the um of your sort of poetic responses you're as it were um going with the psalm and sort of responding as it were from yeah. within it but um but in this one as you do sometimes but i think it's particularly in this one you, you kind of look at the psalm from outside would that would that be yes I, I think every so often i want to just have that moment as it were of a glance to my reader about the book we're both reading you know my reader is reading the psalms as well as reading my poems and i'm reading the psalms and in a sense my conversation is with with a fellow reader of the psalms so there's a one a sense I want to say, well, what, what, what's happening here? Why are we doing this? Where did we come in? What's what's the fit? And, um, you know, so then I talk about about the poetry uh, of the script and the scriptures forming our minds, that this is part of where we've come from. The Psalms like this and to go back to this prime text and then think about where we are now. And what, of course, I turn to then is uh, the very thing that 
is the psalmist's expression of doubt and frustration is the very thing that brings me closest to the psalmist, you know. Yes, yes. I share that, that mm. there's something actually compelling. I mean, I wonder if both the psalmist on the one hand and Herbert on the other with a very dramatic, you know, I struck the board and cried, no more. I, I've had enough of this. I'm giving up. My, my religious phase is over. I'm off, you know. And um, whether they thought that was a terribly daring and, you know, perhaps off-putting thing to do, to be that honest about doubt and frustration. Yeah. But I think the main tenor of my poem is to say, oh, thank God somebody else has been honest. Now I can be honest too. We can both agree that we've had this problem. Yeah. And now we can come together towards that solution. And that solution, as it was, I think, for Herbert as well, is just a recognition that that God is God and we're not God and that we have to trust in his transcendent beauty and wisdom, even when at times we find it frustrating and think we could do better. I think it shows yes, the therapeutic yes. cathartic power of the Psalms too. You know, you've got the yeah. you get it off your chest, and it's important yeah. that we can do that Absolutely. and uh, find yeah. catharsis through it. Yes, I mean, in some ways, I think you get the sense in this psalm of the psalmist, you know, almost doing what <laughs> what you were talking about, actually looking. You know, reflecting on actually all the scriptures that have come before. I mean, like through Psalm one, and said, "But this isn't working." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the evil, are, the people are actually, you know, they're doing frightfully well. You know, they're <laughs> yeah, far yeah. from perishing. They're, yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I I love the the almost colloquial way that Coverdale chose chose to, it's almost as though you could see somebody in a, a farmer's market talking about this and why have the crops fell where he said where he says uh uh they come in no misfortune like other folk you know <laughs> nor are they neither are they plagued like other men you know like it's all fine for some folk you look at them you know this there's almost certainly in the way coverdale's done it there's a kind of colloquial um mm. you know, mm. sort of yeah. Fellow feeling, you know, <laughs> yeah. yes, uh, but actually, I mean, there's also this sort of sense of what you were referring to, and uh, of the sort of kind of daringness. But he said, But if I if I had said I will speak like this, I would have you know betrayed the, all the, these young yeah. people who will think, you know, what is our faith if, 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 yeah. if even he is sort of talking like this? I mean, there's almost, I don't know if the psalmist, in your view, Susan, would have been conscious of this, but there's almost a bit. Like he says, he's just said a bunch of stuff, which yeah. is, yeah, and then he says, now, if I were to say anything like that, I would be making a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not going to, you know. I'm not, I've, I've, I've said it, but it's not me. <laughs> he said it's not me, and I would, you know, here are some of the things I would never say. You know, that's not <laughs> Roger, I'd love to ask you as you're about to read yours as you know from from your your um, illustration as well. Why did you choose Simeon holding Jesus as a response to a psalm like this? Because it's an extraordinary way of interpreting it. Well, it's that it's just that lovely ending. I mean, it is extraordinary the ending, really, isn't it? Yes. And it's, I think you mentioned it's almost one of the very few places where you have this sort of sense in the psalm of actually this life isn't all there is. That there is there is something more. But but it's not just you know it's, it's not just kind of some vague sort of thing. It's actually the closeness to God, <laughs> um, yeah. and it's I mean it's interesting that he. The, the, what changes his view and his struggles to understand it's when he comes into the sacred places of God and I mean with Simeon and Anna it's that sort of sense of you know spending all their days in the temple and then suddenly everything opens up and it's actually when Simeon holds yeah, the, the image of God in his, his arms which is just that extraordinary so I just yeah I just I'd done that picture before and but it just when I was doing the psalm I just suddenly thought this fits. <laughs> it works, but it doesn't. It's very it powerful, you, I think. I, yes, I it makes you well. ask more questions. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I mean, there's there's an awful lot we could talk about this on, but it'd be perhaps nice to have the uh, the, the the Malcolm's poem. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so here's the take on Psalm 73, Quam Bonus Israel. Though one day the whole world will live in him, the story of his saving love began in Israel. And we still honour them, the prophets of the coming Son of Man, whose poetry and scriptures form our mind, as with this psalmist, 
sharing all his pain, his doubts and his frustrations. For we find that all his old misgivings are our own. So in this psalm, he rails against the blind injustice, as it seemed to him, when men who lived by exploitation did so well at the expense of those they cheat. But then you showed him truth beyond the daily veil, how wickedness will vanish like a dream. And when we wait in you, all will be well. Okay. Yeah, we didn't really talk about the um, the violence which he talks about, which is so, it makes this such a pertinent psalm for the moment, but that's a, a nice sort of promise to, to end with. So mm -hmm. thank you.